Mina, Konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here, here to talk to you today about hell. Here we go. It's the hell sermon. The sermon on one of the most highly debated points of Christian theology, definitely in the modern day, not so much in the past. Um, most forms of religion had some form of hell back in the day one way or the other. And if you didn't follow um, the correct path or you did something wrong, there was some horrible punishment awaiting you. Be it the fire of the New Testament or some other method that just <laughs> that, that particular religion went into. Horrible punishments were the norm back in the day. And in early America, horrible hellfire damnation messages were fairly common and fairly normal. They weren't looked down upon. They weren't questioned a whole, whole lot. I don't mind things being questioned. I like things being looked into. I like things being studied. I want the truth of the matter. I want the proper interpretation of this book right here. Um, I try to read it very thoroughly, as uh, <laughs> as you can tell. I need a new one at some point soon. Um, but yeah, I, it's okay to question it. It's okay to even disagree with some of the things your pastor says. As a Christian, it would not be okay for me to disagree with this as a whole, because then I'd have no foundation to stand on, and, well, I wouldn't be a Christian anymore. So that requires me to have an understanding of hell. That other side, I don't talk a whole, whole lot about, because quite frankly, I don't like thinking about it. I don't want to go there. I don't plan on going there. And I believe I found a way out of there. And I believe I know how to make sure that you don't go there. Whoever listens to this video, whoever um, I can get to watch this video, or any of my um, Sunday messages where I extend an invitation to Jesus Christ, I'm hoping that through these messages, to me talking to my camera, to all of you people on YouTube, and on the interwebs in general, that somehow someone will hear this message and someone's heart will be touched and someone will accept Jesus as Lord and Savior because God does not want people to go there. That's one of the things we're going to go into today. I want to make this thorough. I want to make this complete. And quite frankly, I don't want to have to go into this again. I will if I have to, but I want to cover the vast majority in this message so I don't have to have another hell message or another hell topic. It's a horrible place. Again, I don't plan on going there. I don't want anyone going there. And God doesn't want anyone going there. So let's go into the Bible and see what it has to say about hell, about this horrible place that you've heard about. Maybe it was shoved down your throat. Maybe it scared you to death when you heard about it as a child. Um, I'm not here to take away any of the fear or any of the horrible reality. What I'm here to do is to clarify, to shed light on the subject, and to let you know, most importantly, God doesn't want you there. You don't have to go there. That's not what God wants your destination to be. He has a better plan and a better way. So to start this off, let's go into the Old Testament, a book filled with uh, lots of rape, lots of murder, lots of genocide, topics I've covered on this channel on several of my other videos, most of them my shorter videos, looking at the books of, um, jo uh, the books of Joshua and Judges and 1 Samuel. It's... Death and murder are in the Old Testament a lot. What isn't in the Old Testament a lot is discussion of an afterlife. Um, there's a mention in the book of Job about where Job says, How in my flesh I will see God. I don't have that verse prepared because it doesn't address hell. Um, whatever I mention, whether it be a verse specifically or whether it be a quote from the Bible where I say the Bible says this like I just did in the book of Job, seriously, Google is your friend. If you care enough to look it up, if you care enough to want to know where it is, use Google. Just type in the words relatively. Um, you don't have to be specific. It can be something very off kilter. Google can probably find it. It's much better than a traditional Strong's Concordance, which I grew up with when I was learning how to search around the Bible and getting to know the Bible. You can use Google and find stuff, and you can be just somewhat close, and generally you'll get there. The verse I'm going to use, I'm just going to use one Old Testament verse because most of them in regards to hell are generally the same way. And that's going to be Psalm 1610. Yes, I'm actually turning to them in my Bible. I don't have a, I do have tabs open as notes, but I'm actually going to turn to them in the Bible itself just because 
I guess because I'm old and I like flipping through the Bible and I like to do it the way the preachers used to do it before they had projectors and screens. I like to actually flip through, the, flip through the Bible, flip to the page, and it gives me a reason to try to get to know the Bible better and to get to know the books and the chapters and verses a little bit better than I did before. Kind of like the whole um, contacts on your phone list. You don't even know your girlfriend's or even your spouse's phone number anymore because it's saved onto your list and that list is backed up. So sometimes your phone, your, <laughs> your carrier can just put all that info on your new phone. So I like to try to memorize the Bible, especially when it comes to important topics such as this. Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. All of this is going to come out of the New King James Version of the Bible. And the Old Testament word for the land of the dead, or the abyss, or the dark place, or whatever your Bible translation happens to call it, mine actually calls it what the Hebrew word is, Sheol. And all it means is the land of the dead. It doesn't um, have any connotation of good or bad, of consciousness or unconsciousness, of resurrection or no resurrection. The resurrection is mentioned in Job and the book of Daniel. And actually, the book of Daniel does mention at the end of chapter 12. I didn't bother to get the exact verse, so I'm going to find this on the fly. And it's in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. This is the closest you'll find to hell. The actual word Sheol, again, means nothing. It, it has no connotations, so it's really hard to say what the Old Testament means by that. The best we have is in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And that seems to speak of a literal, living, conscious knowledge of contempt and shame just like uh, some will awake to everlasting life. And it's juxtaposed with some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's an eternal state that is good and that is bad. Not much detail is given on what this life or what this shame and contempt entails. We simply know that it is. And the Old Testament doesn't focus too much on it. Why doesn't God go into detail on that in the Old Testament? Why didn't he say, you know, here's how it works. Here's what the afterlife looks like. As a matter of fact, why doesn't the Old Testament go into details of what does um, the spiritual realm look like? You know, the place where God lives. Why focus so much on this world and on history and on the things going on here? How about telling us a little bit about what's going on up there and, you know, what the angels are up to, what the demons are up to, what your arch nemesis Satan is up to. Those things are hinted at, they're mentioned. Not a whole lot of detail has gone into on them in the Old Testament. And I believe the reason for that is because God wants us to focus primarily on living this life for Him. If you believe in Him and you live for Him, you don't have to worry about what everlasting life looks like. You know you got the good side of it. <laughs> and if you don't live for Him, if you live in sin, if you reject Him, then you have shame and everlasting contempt to look forward to. And it also, as someone who believes in the Bible, it's great to have so much historical backing where we can actually look into history, look into other historical books, have archaeologists and paleontologists dig up in the Israeli-Palestinian area and look at all these cool little neat historical artifacts that date back to these times when we can be like, hey, that part we read about in the book of 1 Kings, yeah, well, I just found this thing. I think it belonged to so-and-so king. Really? Yeah, really, check this out. And it's great to base my religion in this reality, in this world in fact, in science, and all those wonderful, tangible things that uh, atheists and agnostics love to say that religious people don't believe in. And we do, or at least some of us do. At least some of us try to connect those dots and make things make sense. The Bible is very much so earth-grounded, and it doesn't focus a whole lot on what's happening in the next life. The New Testament gives us a few more details and since we're focusing on hell and not heaven, the details are not going to be pretty or nice. <clears throat> Let's start with the, it's a very, very, very popular message in the New Testament. Probably the most popular one and the most explicit in regards to hell. And that's in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. I can go to various parts of the Bible fairly quickly because I've taken my time to look into the book 
and to memorize where the books are and to generally know how big they are. And I also know it, this, this Bible's been my Bible for years. When I get a new Bible, it's going to be torture to get into it and try to find things. Maybe not torture, but it's not going to be as easy because I'm familiar with like the layout of this particular Bible. You get used to the um, finer points and spe specificities of it. So Luke chapter 16, verse 19, keep studying the Bible and keep reading it. If you want to be able to do this, if you care, study, dig in, dig deep, put effort into it. It's taken quite a while to be able to flip to things like I do. So, and to even know what to look up in my Google searches. Um, this doesn't have to do with hell, but this Google search to prep me for this particular message took me about 10 minutes because I know where stuff is. And that's not, that's not something that I just did overnight. It's taken years of study to do that. So, study to show yourself approved. That's a Bible verse as well. Back to hell. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. This is Jesus talking. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now why he's asking the person who was poor in, in this life to, help, to like help him in the next and asking Lazarus to send him over to serve him, that level of arrogance is a little shocking to me, but I digress. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Again, ask, trying to use Lazarus as a servant. I don't quite get the logic in that. That you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So to anyone out there listening, demanding works and miracles that happen in Bible days, those things do exist. Um, I'm a firm believer in them. Again, I will say this over and over again. I'm one of those crazy charismatic types who believe in tongues and prophecies and miracles and healings. But if you want to get to know God, this is your best bet right here. There are other religions and other gods who aren't gods, who claim to be gods falsely, and they perform healings and miracles as well. What you need is the Word of God, not some, you know, miracle man, televangelist, or voodoo doctor. So here we learn about hell. There's fire, and there's torment. There's not just shame and contempt. There is actual conscious torment. And apparently people on both sides know what is happening and what's going on. And the only thing, as far as what sends you to hell or what sends you to heaven, I'm certainly going to get into that. Um, th this verse simply says that you received good things in your, in your previous life, Lazarus received his bad things, now he's receiving good things and you're receiving torment. To those of you who are rich or have money and are concerned about this, don't worry. Being rich is not an automatic descent into hell. And for those of you who are not financially well off, don't sit in comfort say, well, I'm going to get what's coming to me in the next life. Being poor alone is not access to heaven. So the next verse on our list is going to be Matthew 25, 41. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. And this is again Jesus talking. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, 
into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So again, um, we have the motif of fire mentioned. I'm going to get back to this verse in just a minute, but to continue a little bit more, more detail on what hell is, we're going to go to Mark chapter 9. I'm going to keep my finger in Matthew 25. I'm going to go back there in just a minute, because that's going to be a, a good segue into what gets you to hell and what gets you out of hell. So Mark chapter 9, we're going to start with verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And this, these are incredibly popular verses. I'm going to break this down very, very quickly. Jesus basically is saying, it's better for you to dismember yourself in some way than to go into hell. So this is kind of a good, so this kind of goes with Matthew 25. Very, very well. Let me use Mark 9 as a jumping board and then plunge into Matthew 25. You know, if your hand, if your foot, if your eye. And let me just go so far as to say, you know, if your genitalia, if your penis, if your vagina, because sex is so often equ um, equated with these verses right here. If these things, if sex itself somehow lures you away from God, you know, it's better to be celibate or it's better to just cut your junk up than to be cast into hellfire. Um, on this channel, I say it like it is. I don't hold back. And I will say things that most men would not say behind a barbed wire barricaded door with a shotgun. Um, <laughs> I, it's not that I have no shame at all. It's just that I really want to get the truth out. So what sends you into sin? Well... Or what sends you into sin? What sends you into hell? Sin does. Answered my own question there. Um, so much for any <laughs> answering the question in a climatic way there. It's sin that sends you into hell. Sin does. And if you're familiar with uh, the Bible or Christianity at all, you know that we're all sinners. Just to very quickly go into that. Let me see if I remember this verse right. Yeah. I'm not going to say what it is, just in case I didn't remember it correctly. Yay me! Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for those of you who want to criticize, well, Brandon, you should know that verse. What's wrong with you? You're trying to preach on YouTube, you know an old basic verse like that? Sorry, I'm trying, and I did get it right. <laughs> Romans 3.23, and that verse just wasn't a part of the initial prep. But yeah, we're all sinners. We're, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So it's not a matter of cutting off your hand, cutting off your foot, plucking out your eye, or cutting off your penis or mutilating your vagina. None of those things are going to get you out of hell and into heaven. If you've sinned, and if you're a sinner, that's what lands you into hell. The fact that you're a sinner and the fact that you have sinned. Those are the things that put you in um, that put you in hell. And it's not just homosexuality. I want I think that's an important note to make. I've mentioned homosexuality in a few of my videos before, and it is a sin. But the man and the woman who have sex outside of God's requirements, they have committed a sin that will equally damn them just as much as the homosexual. And as I also mentioned at least once in my previous videos, in my personal opinion, the man or the woman who cheats on their spouse has committed a sin much worse than homosexuality. Homosexuality is a sin, but it didn't make the Ten Commandments list. Adultery did. So, maiming yourself. And also, if you did, it, it reminds me of some of the church fathers. Like uh, the guy called, there's a guy called Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N. He castrated himself. He cut his balls off. Because lust was a problem. And he did it in accordance with this verse. And that was stupid. 
because cutting off, doing something to your genitalia, cutting it off, mutilating it in some way, hurting yourself when temptation comes your way, those things don't stop you from sinning. Those things don't keep you from sinning. Those things don't keep, and they certainly don't keep sin out of your heart or your mind. Those things are not the solution. Origen completely missed it. And anyone, I don't think anyone nowadays preaches that message that you should self-mutilate yourself. And if anyone is preaching that message, stop. Just stop. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping anyone get into heaven. All you're doing is hurting yourself and telling other people to hurt themselves. Jesus' point in the message in Mark was whatever you need to do to get out of sin, do that. Whatever you need to do to get out of hell, do that. And self-mutilation is not going to do it. It's not going to keep you from sin. And it's not going to keep you from temptation. So plunging off back into Matthew... I'll reiterate verse 41 real quick. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was estranged and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And the verses before that, well, let me just read them. Um, back up to verse 30, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Now I want to also, I, here's another little quick stop portion. The way to not interpret this message is, so those who do good go to heaven and those who do bad go to hell. Wrong. That's not how this works. He, you're not able to feed the hungry or give the thirsty a drink or clothe the naked or take in a stranger and it count for anything unless they're already one of his brethren. So being one of the, and you can't, you also, and contrarily, you can't ignore the hungry, or the thirsty, or the naked, or the stranger. You can't ignore those who are his brethren if, um, if they're not already his brethren. So it's not a matter of doing the good or the bad. You sh if you are righteous, you will do these good things, and if you are unrighteous, you will do these bad things. Notice that the good and the bad didn't really know that they were good or bad. So that's not, that doesn't really help us go to heaven or hell. We're already headed in a certain direction. And we, when we go to the other side and we stand before the king, then we will see the good and the bad that was in our lives. We'll see very clearly where it's here. It's a bit of a muddled mess sometimes, even if, even if you are a believer, even if you are a Christian, someone who's spirit-filled and has gifts and believes in all these wonderful things, and has even done some of these wonderful things. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't quite get it. So that doesn't help us go to heaven or help us to stay out of hell. You are already doing good or bad things. You're already one of his brethren, or you are not. And the blessing or the cursing will follow from there. So what do we take away from all of this? We take away that Hell was created. Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was originally created because Satan and his angels rebelled against God while they were in heaven. The point of this message is to talk about, well, how did Satan fall when he was already in heaven and there was no temptation? The purpose of this message isn't to get into that. The purpose of this message is to talk about hell. 
And because Satan and his demons fell away from God, right there in the presence of God, God created hell for them. Do not believe anyone, anyone who says that Satan and his demons will be saved in the end. Jesus, God in the flesh, says otherwise. That doctrine is completely and totally wrong and against the teachings of God himself. So what must we do to go to hell? And the answer is nothing. You don't have to do a thing. We've all sinned and we've come short of the glory of God. And sin is what sends us into hell. Well then, if, if I'm born damned, well, what am I supposed to do? How can I be saved? That is an excellent question. And the answer is repent and believe that Jesus Christ, the man who spoke so much of this stuff that I just covered right now, that he wasn't just a man, that he was God in the flesh, that he came and he died on the cross paying your price, shedding his blood to get rid of all the sin that you ever committed. And he rose again three days later as a guarantee, as a promise of the eternal life in heaven that is to come. You want to get rid of sin? You want to stay away from sin? You don't mutilate yourself. You don't cut off your penis, cut off your balls, or cut into your vagina, or cut off your clitoris. The answer is you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you ask Him to come into your heart, and to forgive you of any sins you've committed, and help you to stay away from the sins that still tempt you, and still try to draw you away from Him. You're, you become one of His brethren, and then you do the good things. If you're not one of his brethren, you're already doing the bad things. You're already not taking in those who are his, or feeding them, or giving them drink, etc., etc., etc. And even if you are doing so many of these good things, and you're like, well, I've helped Christians out before, <laughs> how can you say I haven't done those things? Please keep in mind, as far as heaven and hell are concerned, Again, it's not works-based. You're already one of his brethren helping his brethren, or you're already one of his not-brethren not helping the brethren. So if you're one of the non-believers and you, in, you are helping believers, that is awesome, that's a good thing, and that is wonderful. I'm certainly not going to object to it. But that doesn't make you one of his brethren. That doesn't put you in the group of the people that are already on their way to heaven. Good works don't cut it. Good works won't get you into heaven. Jesus alone does that. The cross alone is sufficient for that. His blood alone is sufficient to forgive all of that sin. And by the way, just because you do good things doesn't mean that judgment is somehow skipped over or abated or lessened for you. If you stand before the judge and you've done, whether it's the worst thing in the world, let's say you raped and killed a five-year-old. Again, I'm not holding anything back on this channel. Or let's say you've done something really ridiculously tiny, like you've, you went over the speed limit. And you say, and let's, let's go with the speed limit one because that's light. And not many people would, a lot of people would be willing to forgive that. Not many people would be willing to forgive a, a, a serial killer child rapist. But you stand before that judge, and you've, you've gone over the speed limit. And he's like, okay, here's your fine. And you say, but judge, I fed the poor this week. He'll be like, that's awesome. Keep doing that. You, s you, still, are, you still owe the court. And he'll be like, but judge, I adopted two orphans. And he's like, that, that's great. You know, I hope you keep feeding them and clothing them, and I hope your job goes well so you can keep providing for them. But you also need to provide for this some speed thing. And he'll be like, but judge. I'm a faithful man. I've, I've only had one wife and I've never cheated on her. And he'll be like, that's, that's wonderful. That's great. Please keep her and don't cheat on her. But you still owe this fine. The way judgment works is when you've done something wrong, you still owe the fee. And the wages of sin is death. And after death, hell. As I've shown from the scripture today. And, the, and if for any remaining objections, well, like, what about all those good works? Why do I have to be a Christian to be saved? Why do I have to believe in Jesus? Why can't I go to heaven based on the good works? Don't they count for something? If you look in Isaiah, and I didn't prepare that verse ahead of time, 
This one time, I'm actually going to take a minute to look up this verse. I'm going, to, I'm going to type it into the computer because I want you to be able to look this verse up very, very quickly because this subject, I don't, I, I usually encourage, you know, open thought, free thinking, and going out for the information yourself. This is so incredibly important. I'm like, I'll let him be just a little bit lazy here. All of our good deeds. All of our good. And Google filled it in. All of our good deeds are as filthy rags. That is in Isaiah 6. Is that Isaiah 64, 6? And that's what I'm getting. Let's look it up and find out if Google got it correct. Went a little over 30 minutes, but please forgive me for that. I want to get this all out as fast and as good as possible. Yep, that's it. Isaiah, again, you don't even have to type it in really great or perfect to a certain translation. Google can fill it in for you. So I, if you watch this far, you, you saw living proof of this. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing. Well, I've already covered that. We're all sinners, come short of the glory of God. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. It really is just bad news all around. By the way, the word for filthy rags, if you look it up in the Hebrew, that's a bloody minstrel cloth. So all your good deeds that you've done are like a bloody tampon before God. And you're waving this bloody tampon. Look at all the, how great I am. Look at how wonderful I am. That, that's gross. That's disgusting. Ugh. That is so foul. But that's what our good deeds amount to. You can't impress the creator of the universe. You've sinned. And he died for you on the cross. He gave his, he wrote himself into his own story. Because as God, he's cool enough to do that. How much would all of us weeaboo and anime nerds love to write ourselves into some of those stories? Oh, some of them are downright scary and would never want to be a part of those. But anyway, he wrote himself into a very dirty, foul story. He wrote himself into a world that was quite dark and quite evil. And he paid a horrible price by dying on that cross. And he did it for me and he did it for you. Why would, with a sacrifice like that, why wouldn't you accept it? Why would you try to do it on your own? So what do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. You're born a sinner, and if you don't believe in Jesus, you will surely perish. You've already sinned. Your good deeds can't save you. What can you do to get out of hell? Repent of your sins. Believe in Jesus Christ. Turn to Him. Accept His righteousness. And just to give you, give you another verse out of the book of Romans again, this is going to be Romans 10.9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Just like that old hymn said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin was like a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I don't think I got that exactly correct. Please forgive me. Didn't get that exactly correct or right, please forgive me, but essentially that's it right there. If you want to be saved, God himself paid that price. He came to earth as Jesus Christ, he died on the cross, and he rose again. And he wants you to believe in him. He doesn't want you to burn in hell. He doesn't want you to go there. That was created for Satan and his angels who rebelled against him in heaven before God in all of his glory. God's plan for us is different. He wants us to be in heaven with him. He wants you to be his son or his daughter. And it, it, it just it, accept him as your Lord and Savior. There's nothing more I need to say. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. That's what needs to be done. That's how you get out of hell. That's how you avoid the fate of the man that I knew earlier this week who continually rejected God and refuse to believe it, despite having one of those out-of-body experiences, and being convinced through experience that there was something else other than this life. And he just refused to believe in God. And this message was prompted because of him, and because of my very boldly titled message yesterday, please don't fall to his fate.
Please accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If nothing else, do it for your own sake. And if you want a model prayer to follow, pray this prayer for me. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell, but I admit that I deserve it. Yes, that is part of the prayer. I deserve it. I'm a sinner, and I've sinned against you. But I know that you died for me on the cross. You shed your blood to forgive all my sin. And you rose again three days later. And you're alive and well. And you promised me eternal life with you. Please forgive me for my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I believe you rose again three days later. And I believe that you will forgive me since I've asked you to. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus that now I get to spend eternity in heaven with you. Help me to stop sinning against you and help me to live for you from this day forward. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, then please rest assured, hell is behind you, heaven is before you, Jesus Christ is your Lord, your God, your King, and your Savior. And you don't have to worry about hell anymore. And that is what God wants for everyone down here. That's why we Christians are so pesky about preaching our gospel message because we have an answer to the problem in this world called sin. And it's Jesus. And the problem lies in us. And we need to come to him one by one individually and accept him as our Lord and Savior. That's why I do this YouTube channel. That's the primary reason. Yeah, I love my video games. And yeah, I love to make a living off of, the, off of these videos. That's why they're monetized. But primarily, I do it because I want to get this word out. That Jesus is Lord. That you don't have to go to hell. That you don't have to be afraid. That there is a good path through this life. And Jesus is that path. If you just accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, welcome to the family. Hallelujah, that is awesome. Please get into this Bible. Well, not this one. This is mine. Please don't take it from me. Please get your own. They're relatively cheap. And just read it every single day. At least a little bit. At least a little bit. Start in the New Testament. That's probably going to be a little bit easier to understand. And it talks a little bit more about how to live this life in New Testament post Jesus times. So start off there. If you want a good place to start, read the book of John. It's a great gospel to start in. And pray a little bit every day. Just saying, God, I, I messed up again. Would you please forgive me? Or, God, the situation sucks. I need your help. Or, God, thank you so much for a wonderful day. And thank you for saving me. And thank you that I'm with you. That's a prayer, too. Something that simple is a prayer. Also, make sure you find a group of people, other Christians who believe the same thing you do. It'll really help encourage you and strengthen you, push you forward in this new faith you have in Jesus Christ. The video has gone over, but I want to cover the subject as thoroughly as possible. Thank you for watching to the very end. For those of you who did, hopefully it ministered to you and answered some questions. To those of you who had it, and to those of you who don't believe in Jesus, please believe me when I say God loves you. Christians should love you, and if they don't, on behalf of Christians and on behalf of the church, I am sorry. They're not acting like Jesus. God loves you. I love you. And we don't want you to go to hell. That's not part of the plan. That's not what God wants. And all you need to do is ask Him and say, Yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I need help. All you have to do is humble yourself before God and admit you need His help. So thank you guys very much for watching this video. This is a heavy topic. Kind of glad it's out of the way. I'm also really glad, though, that I preached it because this was important. This was really important. Hell's real. And God doesn't want us there. That's meant for the devil and his angels, not us. So thank you very much for watching this video. I love you. God bless.